Okay, where is God? And specifically, where is God at work? It's easier for us to see God at work in the hearts and minds of people we love, for the things that go right, for fortunate windfalls, but what about when things go wrong? Or what about the people we don't like? Is God at work in the hearts and minds of our enemies, too? The book of Daniel has something to say about that, and that's what we're talking about this week on the live show. Kindred UMC live show features adults discussing adult topics, occasionally with adult language. It may not be suitable for young viewers. Please use discretion before watching. Hello, all. Welcome once again to the Kindred UMC pre-recorded live show coming to you not live but pre-recorded from my front room aka Kindred Studio. Eh? My name is Chris Hayden. I am the pastor of Kindred UMC. My name is Francisca Hassler. I'm the pastor's wife. <laughs> and I'm Preston and I am not. I think. It's a very sexy role. <laughs> we elected her pastor's wife and her job <laughs> It's an elected to position. satisfy all of my needs. She's appointed. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, brother. I realized I left my cup and I'm going to be <clears throat> humming. You so if I don't have it the this entire time. This feels like a mistake. This, uh -oh. is, this feels like a Oh, no, a I found it. I found it. It's, it's much nearer oh, than I thought. You have it. Oh, brother. <laughs> okay. It's right over here. Here we go. So we're continuing week two of Daniel. Really? Yeah, the book of Daniel. No. Oh. So Daniel is a. Uh, I still don't have an answer, even though I said this last week. I don't know if it's a minor prophet or a major prophet or whatever, but it's kind of in that in-betweeny place. So um, this is this is a book that was written about 2,300 years ago, give or take, you know, as best we can. And it's set during a period called the exile. So this is when uh, the Jews were conquered by uh, Babylon and exiled from Jerusalem and Israel to the, the nation of Babylon, where some of the really special royal class of, of you know, sons and daughters, well, let's, let's face it, it's sons, because girls aren't worth anything. That's what they believe. Don't quote me on that. Please don't isolate that. That's what they believe. That's not what I believe. I believe girls are very valuable, but they did not. And so they isolated certain specific sons from royal families and brought them to the Babylonian royal court to be tested and, and kind of be put to use in order to like incorporate them into Babylonian society so that they would become Babylonian. And that way you don't have any enemies. You don't have any like sons and daughters of your enemies who are gonna like wage holy war on you generations later because they're all Babylonian now. Or at least that, that was the theory. So Daniel and his friends, they all get, this is a recap from last week. If you want to skip this, just go to last week. Um, Daniel and his compatriots are given new names. They're kind of stripped of their um, cultural identity and in order to become Babylonian. And last week we talked about they uh, they refuse to eat the the rations that Babylonians give them, and they instead adhere to their faithful, uh, like the diet that God has given them, and they end up becoming healthier and better, and, and they gain prestige, and like it works out for them in their favor. Okay, so this week we're going to look at chapter two of the book of Daniel, and it's a really long one. <laughs> And so I'm going to skip ahead a bit. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Okay. Uh, so what happens is the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, he has all of these enchanters and magicians and like courtyard people. And they are, they're essentially like the intelligence apparatus of the nation. They interpret the king's dreams, that's their role. And that's, that's like the thought process. This is how you know what's going to happen, what's, what's in the future. And so the king says, I've had a dream that I know is really important to the future and I need it interpreted accurately. Does he say this every day? No, <laughs> just this one time. Okay, just yeah. making sure it's not, not like this. not. It's yeah. not like me. Okay, hey. just because I say it every day doesn't mean 
I have another one. I've got another dream. <laughs> no, this is this is a, a specific dream where he says, "I know this is meaningful, and any and I need it interpreted." And all of the enchanters and magicians are like, "Great, tell us your dream." And he says, "Oh no, 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 no! You tell me my dream, and that's how I will know if you interpret it correctly. You have to tell me my dream." And then he ups the stakes, and he says. And by the way, if you tell me my dream and you get it wrong, off with your head. <laughs> like he's like fair, a murderous, like a murderous bad person. Um, and uh, but if you do a bad turd, yeah. If you tell me my dream <laughs> and interpret it correctly, then you will be elevated to the highest. You know, we'll give you all the all the all the rewards. So all of the. Um, you know, enchanters and interpreters. And so obviously they're like, this is ridiculous. You can't ask us, to, like, that's impossible. We can't do that. And so he's like, okay, then kill all of them. Like off with all of their heads. So then Dan, so Daniel is in the, and so is, are his compatriots. They are now, because of this, because of last week's story, they're part of the enchanters and magicians. And so he's like, stuck in this place of, okay, if I don't do this, then we'll we'll all die. If I do this successfully, then I will be helping the king that invaded and murdered my people, exiled me, destroyed the temple, pulled the covenant, uh, the, the Ark of the Old Covenant from the temple and brought it to about, like, He's stuck in this place of like, what do I do here? Like, and and ultimately he decides that God has put him in this place to actually interpret and like act like accurately tell this king the dream and, and interpret the future. And he decides that he's going to help the king, even though the king is his enemy. I okay? remember the scene from the musical. Oh, do you? <laughs> do you now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's why these things are helpful. <laughs> <clears throat> was it a VeggieTales musical? Mm. Okay, well, then I don't approve of it. <laughs> um, this is Daniel chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 24, and it goes like this. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men. He's the, kind of the executioner of the king, uh, Arioch. Uh, who the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon and said to him, so Daniel says to Arioch, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will give the king the interpretation. So Daniel's stepping up to the plate and being like, all right, I'll do it. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found among the exiles of Judah, these are all the the people who have been brought to the court, the, the exiles from Judah, a man who can tell the king the interpretation. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Balthasar, uh, Baltazar, pa, ba, 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 Baltazar. This is we talked about last week. That he was given a new name, as all the Jewish royals were, and it's to strip them of their cultural uh, cultural identity. Um, so, Baltazar, are you able to tell me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered them. No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or diviners can show to the king the mystery that the king is asking. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has disclosed to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen the end of days. Your dream and the vision of your head as you lay in bed were these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be hereafter, and the revealer of mysteries disclosed to you what is to be. But as for me, the mystery has not been revealed to me because of any wisdom that I have that I have more than any other living being, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. That's uh, verse 30. All right, I'm going I'm to stop there because it goes on. And essentially the thing you need to know is that he goes on to correctly describe the dream and interpret the dream. So Daniel... Tells his friends to like pray and fast for this important thing that's going to happen. And then he goes before the king where not just his life, but multiple lives are online. 
and he correctly interprets what's going on. And I want to, so I want to talk about, there are these moments, and I, as a chaplain in the hospital, there are these moments where you pray for a miracle and against all odds, it comes through. And so before I go any further, have you ever seen anything like that? Where like, where it was just something that just didn't make sense and shouldn't have worked out, but instead things went the way they were supposed to, or the way you wanted them to, the way you needed them to. Have you ever seen what you would describe as a miracle? Yeah, this one's kind of terrifying. Uh, I was dating a, my a, favorite kind. I was dating a uh, human being. <laughs> that good start. That's good. Was not the nicest of people. Uh, and, she, and when I would leave um, to go back to school, back to up at the FSU, which is a four hour drive, I should have been leaving at like three or four to get there around seven or eight and I at least have some time to sit and, you know, not fall asleep while driving, which is the hint here. Um, so after leaving Orlando at, you know, promptly at 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> driving up to Tallahassee, takes four hours to get there. About 1.30, I'm driving on back roads and start to fade in and out of consciousness, just oh, in and out of yeah, sleep, I, in yeah, and out of sleep. There. No headlights because it's backcountry roads. No one else is awake at this time. It's like 1.30 in the morning. And uh, the last time I do it, um, it, it felt too good to be true. It just felt like I'm taking a nap right now and I don't think I should be because my brain would just shut off. So that was the last, <sighs> um, and I woke up uh, cockeyed, and then flattening down on the ground on my wheels, thank God. And then there, there's no, there's no signs on either side of the road telling me which way is which. GPS is out because it's a little earlier in time before GPSs were really good and satellite and stuff. Um, so one, I'm, I'm discombobulated. It's two, somehow I haven't done four flips and landed on my tires or landed in the woods on both sides with deer and bear and all kinds of crap that's just hanging out there waiting for a truck to flip over. Bobcat, just hold Oh, (laughs) meat popsicle, perfect. (laughs) Um, So waking up with the world turned on its hinge for a second and not knowing, because you know, you're groggy and have, I forgot I was driving, there's nuts. And then falling, just and then kind of i don't know there's nothing to explain besides something was either looking out for me or i whatever i can only say it's a miracle that's that, terrifying very terrifying. very terrifying and nightmare fuel and i did not i don't think i went to sleep until the next night <laughs> i think i stayed up the whole night that night <laughs> how about you um i was thinking about this when you kind of gave me the tip that that was the question. Don't listen, don't, that's behind the scenes special (laughs) information. Um, I don't really have miracles like that. Um, And I I have a a story from my grandmother who... I'm... uh What what about... Okay. Uh, So my grandma used to call, she had a rough, rough whole life. Um, And she used to say that, um, like, uh, she didn't believe in like angels, but she believed that people came into her life and they were the angel that saved her or helped her through whatever thing. But, so like the people. <clears throat> and there is something for me that's more like a grounded, like I'm too much of a realist like to be door, like- Every door, oh. every day. I mean. Yeah, so like for me, a moment of that was- uh, It's difficult because I'm literally looking at our front door. <laughs> so every door. Uh huh. <laughs> Oh, they're saying there's an angel there. Like yeah, I can, I can see one, but obviously you can't. Every because, day, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the door's right the there. Door. Yeah. So I said every door. Um, so I, the first thought that came to mind was when I was living with my brother, and like um, our relationship was going sour. I had been living in the base in a basement for at this point, I think, two years. And this I, is in a state where they have basements. Yes, Kansas, um, where basements exist. If you look Google basement, if you don't understand, just what a, a bonus. Is. It's like a whole bonus house down <laughs> it's an there. Underground pool. It's um, a whole not, it's, it's a, a whole, whole other level. House. Yeah, and yeah, I lived down there. I had a shower and a kitchen. It was a whole thing. Um, but I like life was good and on the forefront. It felt good and everything was fine. Um, but I would talk to my mother who was living abroad in Taiwan and. You know, she wasn't there to see it, but she would talk to me. And one day she kind of just says, I think you're depressed. And I hadn't really thought about it. Like, 
everything seemed fine. I sleep in till three or four. I go out and party with my friends and then I stay up till five or six. Is that not, come on, I'm like 22, that sounds great. Um, And after that phone call, she called me back in the next like 24 hours and said, uh, okay, I spoke to your grandmother. Um, She says she'll put you up for however long, you'll go stay with her and, and yeah, like, if you want to do that, let's do it. And within the next month, I w- I left. I moved out, packed all my stuff up, and lived with my grandmother. And it like there is this little that miracle of having somebody be able to recognize that in like I wasn't able to see it. There's something about when things fall into place perfectly. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, for me, and I can't talk specifics because it's inappropriate. But as a chaplain at the hospital, there are, there I've seen stories where people have been at the bedside praying against all odds that their loved one would survive and the doctors are being like, this this is an impossible, you need to start making peace with the fact that this is not gonna happen. Um, And then they remove like life support and the person wakes up. I've seen that happen on more than one occasion. It's incredible, it's amazing, it's miraculous. The other piece I need to introduce to this conversation, and this is something that Daniel actually is kind of, uh, it's dealing with in, in a less direct way. What about all the times when that doesn't happen? You know, we, we love the stories when mom or dad is at the bedside praying for this to happen and it comes through and God delivers a miracle. And that's a fine story and that's a good story for people who, like that happens, that does, that happens. However, we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we never talked about, what about the times when you pray with all your heart for something that you believe you need and want and, and like for someone else and it doesn't work out that way. Like the, the first, um, my first baptism as a minister was for a five-day-old infant who the doctors were telling these parents, it's never going to, like, this child is not going to live. And I baptized, his name was Kevin Patrick, and I baptized him, and two days later, he died. And it, and we, like, it, it, was, it was obviously his parents and me and, like, a whole department of chaplains were just, like, praying for this kid to live and it didn't go that way. The reason I bring this up is because one of the questions that's going on in the book of Daniel is, so Babylon has sacked the temple, stolen the Ark of the Covenant. The understanding for the for the average Judean, Jewish, Israelite person was that that's where God lives. Like God has come down from heaven to be in the temple, in the tabernacle. And now Babylon has stolen that. And so the question that Daniel is mostly dealing with is, is God in Israel or is God in Babylon? And the surprise answer for most people who read that story the first time is that Daniel arrives in Babylon and even in, in he he discovers that God is even at work in the dreams of his enemy king that God is at work in all of the things and so the thing that this story begs of us is yes it's wonderful when like answered prayers go the way we want them to but the thing that this story begs of us is to lean into a deeper theology that calls us into looking for where God is active in the sorrow and in the tragedy and the things that don't go our ways. And even in the hearts and minds and dreams of what we would consider our enemies. So the question is, who is your enemy? Who is the other? Who is at your opposition? Where are the places where you just cannot imagine that God is at work and God is doing things? And if you are, if you're willing to take up this calling, then you are called to seek and cooperate with the work of God in all of those places. We're out of time. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.